and 39. Of course, coming to an end, we've had all the major subjects. We have only one pranayama left. I wonder if you have any questions. No questions. Okay. I hope that you have developed a good idea what yoga really is about. Um, we live in a world where yoga has been diluted enormously for the sake of uh, um, commercial purpose to make money out of it. Um, all the valuable elements basically have been thrown out and it has uh, been um, reduced to a physical exercise mainly surrounded by a veil of mystery Yoga is a science of life, it really is. The word yoga can be translated as life, but in a very specific way. Yoga is consciousness. Yoga is not a superficial way of spirituality that you see in many spiritual communities where there is a hierarchy and where there is um, uh, self-importance um, lots of ego but it's really something that you do in silence it's really something that you do on your own um, maybe you're familiar with the concept of jihad Jihad, you ever heard of Jihad? Um, the terrorists that in the name of Islam commit crimes, murders, um, war. They do that under the guise of Jihad, they call it Jihad. Jihad they call a holy war. But this is a total distortion of what jihad really is. You know, this is jihad. Jihad is your internal struggle. You do not kill people in society under the, the, the guise of a holy war. That holy war is taking place in your heart. The book called Bhagavad Gita is written about that internal struggle. Jihad is uh, uh, the process of becoming conscious because you, in Islam, you start praying and reading the holy scriptures, leading to questions. Consciousness naturally leads to investigation, questions, um, leading to possible conflicts also. Conflicts with yourself, conflicts with the outside world. Jihad is, is your struggle on that path. But of course, it is non-violent. Anything that is in the name of some God cannot be but non-violent. Yoga is about consciousness. It's not about um, pretending to be something or something else. It's really about continuing living life as you are, each and every individual in their own way. But now with the added dimension of consciousness, you continue to enjoy your your vices, daily life, you continue to go through your struggles. 
But from now on, you do that consciously. The fact that you start living consciously leads to growth, unprecedented growth, enormous growth over time. And it's a process that will continue for the rest of your life. It is a quality that you have acquired as a result of your yoga practice in combination with your study that has opened a door that will not be shut anymore. The door will not close anymore. Of course, you go on with your life. You may become distracted from your regular yoga practice. You will always come back to it whenever the opportunity arises. And while you don't practice, that door is still open. Your process of investigation, your consciousness does not turn off. It may slow down a little bit because you are busy with other things, but that's a very important part of the process that we are in. You cannot only be dedicated to yoga practice and study of the books. You need to put it into practice and you do that in your daily life, at work, your relationships, the way that you eat, drink, in everything that we do. And because you do it consciously, you investigate, you, you observe, very importantly, you become a very skillful observer in everything that happens inside and outside of you. You become, you become, um, you become a skillful puzzler, able to see complex patterns, able to connect the dots. That is a natural quality all of you already have or will more and more develop as a result of starting out on the path of yoga. Last week I mentioned um, that it's, it's not always easy to follow this path. Um, there can be moments of despair, moments that you um, might regret having started on this path, following your heart, making crucial decisions in life. Anytime that happens, Remember that everything has a reason and a purpose. Even in that example that I pictured, the fellow yoga practitioner that made very um, um, big choices in his life in regard to his family and his career, um, things happen for a reason and if we make if we make decisions that in hindsight on the surface appear to be wrong don't forget there is always a reason and a purpose if only to strengthen us if only to teach us to handle failure, to teach us to deal with defeat. And as a result of that, grow. Grow more, become stronger, acquire qualities you didn't possess before. Giving up is never a solution. It never is, ever, until the day you die. Because the moment that we give up, all that we have done before comes to nothing. The biggest 
stumbling block, I repeat, and I have said it many times, is ego. Oh my God, what have I done? Oh, look at pity for me. Ego is just part of us. And it, is, it becomes more and more important that we see, that we see, see ego at work. That when we find ourselves in a situation, that we see that ego is trying to, to put a spanner in the works. It is because of ego that we fail to, to be objective in seeing the situation for what it is. In case of the, the fellow yoga practitioner who gave up, thinking the, that he had completely failed and made big mistakes, and regretted them enormously. Um, he was not capable of detecting or, or acknowledging, admitting maybe is the right word, that those mistakes well, first and foremost, there is the issue of ignorance. That was the last major subject that we studied, is that everything that goes wrong and leads to misery starts always with ignorance. And it then has a sliding scale down all the way down to the to the where we get stuck in fear. But if you don't give up, you reverse back. Instead of the sliding scale down, you now go up, you go back to ignorance and you turn ignorance into insight. And he may have done that several times until that last time that he just couldn't do it anymore. He gave up self-lamenting, feeling sorry for himself. Which is understandable because we know how it works, but it's so destructive. Don't ever let that happen. Instead of lamenting ourselves for the misery that has come into our lives, just try to objectively see why it is happening. And the conclusion is always, in the first place, it's out of ignorance that we end up there. But also, it tells us something about our past, about how we are conditioned, how we are wired by past experience. Instead of losing ourselves in self-pity, let's try to see what is behind it? Why did I end up in that situation while the people around me don't? Because we are all wired differently and the fact that you undergo that misery consciously and develop the ability to put ego aside and view objectively, that will allow you to see crucial information about who you really are apart from how you are conditioned, or how you really are based on subconscious developments that go all the way back to early childhood. This process cannot happen without pain, without suffering, without failure. 
it is because of setbacks, it is because of misery that we are forced to reflect on things. That we are basically allowed to grow and develop. To put it in another way, if life is all roses and, uh, uh, how do you say, in Dutch we say roses and moonshine, if everything is uh, perfect and there is never any conflict and any uh, failure, we don't grow. And when you see that, when you understand that, you will change your perception about misery, about suffering, about failure. Instead of feeling sorry for ourselves, we start looking for opportunity when negative things happen. We try after absorbing the blow initially because we're only human, we get hit by some emotion, we quickly switch into another mode. The fact that you feel emotion is very important because it tells you it is, an, it, is, it is an alarm bell that tells you something is happening that needs attention. It does not mean something is happening that is designed to destroy you or make you suffer unnecessarily. The sad thing is that many human beings, because of ego, have a tendency to drown in that emotion or at least for too long, unnecessary long. We develop the ability to, we absorb the blow, the pain, and quickly switch into a mode where we say, what's going on here? What happened? And instead of pointing fingers at others, we look at our role in whatever it is that is unfolding. Other people's role is not our concern, it's their concern, it's their task to investigate. Blame also is an unnecessary uh, or useless exercise. That doesn't mean that when other people are to blame for something, that, it should, that you should see it as something that is okay. Just see it as an observation. And maybe that is then a person that you do not want to associate anymore further down the road out of self-protection. But losing yourself in blame is just the same as losing yourself in self-pity or, or any other kind of emotion. It's just an alarm bell. And that's how we have to deal with it. How we have to perceive it. If ever you get stuck, after you have tried, after you have done what you think you can do, if ever you get stuck, drop me a line. I have developed the skill to very quickly come to the essence of what is going on and give you practical insight so that you can move beyond whatever obstacle you are facing. And I always reply. I need to soak up the story that you tell me. That will take a day or two. I always reply. And that is a commitment until the day I die. Because it's my responsibility that you are on this path. It's my responsibility that your consciousness has expanded. And it is my responsibility that you come across misery. That's not a bad thing, that's a good thing. But if you ever come to the point that you're about to give up, 
in sheer desperation, dropping the light. At the workshop, I think at the workshop I told you that if you, if only you attend the three hour workshop, you already, you already know, not only know, but also understand more about yoga than most certified yoga teachers. Your knowledge of yoga, even though this was just a short course, is unparalleled in this world of superficial approach. There are even scholars in yoga who do not understand on a practical level what yoga really is about. They can recite texts and impress you with, uh, with uh, text out of the Vedas or, or other holy books. They can theorize about those texts at length without, without, actually, without actually giving you any practical insight or knowledge. You will see when you meet other yoga people and you start talking about yoga, you will, you will notice that their, their insights, their knowledge is, is often, uh, it's either non-existent or it's very superficial. Now about teaching yoga, <laughs> the question comes up. This is a teacher training course. Why, why don't we learn how to teach? And the answer to that is as follows. If you look at other yoga teacher training programs, If you follow classes of students of that program, you will see that they all teach in the same way. That they even say the same things. They have become conditioned. They have become a clone. They are parroting what they were taught to, to say, to teach. And that is so totally in contradiction with what yoga is all about. Yoga is about liberation, not creating another prison, another conditioning. To be a real yoga teacher you have to teach in your own way. The insight and the knowledge you have. And if you don't know where to start, start at the beginning. My first yoga classes, I started with lesson one. Three pose. Triangle pose. White triangle pose. And then the next week, I will do lesson two. If you don't know what to do based on your feeling, intu intuition, just start with what you know. It evolved to the point that I started before class making a list. These are the exercises that I want to do. It had evolved from the schedule. And I would have that list next to me. 
Then I started ignoring. I used it as a guideline, but I dropped some of those exercises out and I then would introduce other exercises that I had not written down in preparation. And then it came to the point that I didn't need a list at all anymore. It came to the point that I didn't even know what I was going to do at the start of the class. But we always start with the spinal twist and we then simply go from there, intuitively. I'm not saying that that is how you should do it. There are many books about yoga. There are many tutorials about how to teach. But follow your feeling, that is the most important. And after I started with the teaching asana, I naturally started I had this desire to give people more. So I looked back at my notes from my classes with Ajita. And lesson one is Yama, Ahimsa. So I prepared for a class where I was going to explain about Ahimsa. And I built it up gradually from there. Do not be a clone of anybody. Follow your heart, be yourself. Very important, be yourself. Don't pretend. You don't have to pretend anything. You know much more about yoga than anybody. You don't realize it yet, but you will see. What I noticed in the beginning, I didn't have a high thought of myself as a yoga teacher, but I was drawn into teaching yoga because I just arrived in Korea for a couple of months. I got lonely. I wanted to, I lived in Sadangdong, only Korean people, most of those, almost nobody spoke English there. So I called the Dutch embassy and I asked if there is any activities where Dutch people meet. And they had a gathering a couple of weeks down the road, twice a year in August and in uh, February when people come back from their summer and their winter holiday and new people come and old people have left, new people come, they have this gathering. And so, you know, you go there, you drink a beer, you eat some uh, Dutch snacks and what have you. The question is always, what are you doing here? So, well, I came to Korea to practice Hapkido, but I'm a yoga teacher. Oh, you are a yoga teacher. And then you start talking about yoga and they're so intrigued that they want to learn. And that's how it started. You will see that people will want to hear what you have to tell. Because you have things to tell about yoga. You don't realize yourself yet, but you have to, things to tell about yoga, insights about yoga that they've never heard of before. And that, that only makes their interest in yoga even bigger than it already was. Because many people, most people in this world who have an interest in yoga, subconsciously they have an inkling, they have an idea about what yoga is about. Through, through things that they have read, or seen in documentaries and yet every time they try a yoga class it's not there and then when you start talking about what you know and understand about yoga the dots connect and they think see this is what I've always been looking for and they will want to learn they will even arrange a place for you to start or suggest where you can go. Be yourself. Don't pretend anything. And if you don't know, look it up. So, 
So the next question then is why is this called a teacher training course? <laughs> you don't even learn how to teach. That is because out of all yoga that is being offered, you learn very systematically what yoga is about. And it is the best preparation for anybody who wants to be a teacher. Throughout the years we had many peoples, many, many, many people who already were yoga teachers. Some with, with several certificates and having, having done several kinds of yoga teacher training courses. And they came to Magic Pond Yoga to learn what yoga really is about. And it makes a huge difference in how they proceed afterwards. It just makes their, um, it just added, it, it just added a whole new dimension to how, not only how they see yoga themselves after having done many courses before, but also how they then bring it to the people. It's called a teacher training course because except for teaching technique, which it does not contain, it has everything you need to know to be a qualified teacher. To claim that you know what yoga is about. Well, many certified yoga teachers do not. They've never read or studied the Hatha Yoga Pradipika or the Yoga Sutras of Patanjali, which is, which is basic, which is the foundation of yoga, the Bible of yoga, both books. And at last, you will become a natural healer. Not one with hocus pocus and all kinds of funny rituals, but people who are on this path develop more harmony but also develop insight in the law of cause and effect. They naturally become alchemists who can turn lead into gold. Turning lead into gold is symbolism. Foolish chemists throughout the centuries have tried to actually turn lead into gold and of course it failed. Lead is symbolism for chaos, disharmony, while gold is symbolism for harmony. And gold literally is harmonious compared to other metals. That is why it is a precious metal. That is why it is expensive. But you will see conflicts where in the past you were not able to bend it or shape it or change it. You will naturally step in and put water on the fire. You will naturally develop the need, not only the ability, but the need to bring people together whenever you can. I started doing that naturally when I started practicing yoga 
and I started healing my family. I didn't know at that time. I was just following my feeling, I was just following my heart. But my family was torn apart. Everybody was hurting for several years. After the divorce of my parents, seven children in their teenage years, three ending up with drug abuse, one with a premature uh, out of wedlock child, the age of 17, and a mom that had to deal with all that without the support of a husband. The family was hurting and nobody trusted anybody anymore. And I started organizing gatherings. I started organizing, when somebody was having their birthday, I organized a party, I would gather money from the other family members and buy some nice present. I started organizing, in, in August I would already make a, 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 a reservation for Christmas dinner altogether, preceded by bowling or by, at the time you had a Chinese circus that visited uh, Europe uh, every year. We would do something fun, have dinner together and go home. Two weeks ago, we, we were invited by a Korean couple and um, there's just a lot of disharmony. The, the wife had uh, cooked European food, a very nice soup with lots of healthy ingredients. But there was constant complaining. Oh, it's too salty. Oh, it's this. Oh, it's that. And then, <laughs> and then the man said he was complaining about his wife being uh, in um, menopause, starting menopause. And you know what I did very naturally? Every time there was a complaint, I gave a compliment. No, the food is really nice, and look at all this healthy, it's healthy, and, uh, and then when you start, <laughs> it's cultural, and it's accepted, but not for me. So I started talking, I, I just said, because he's, he's my age, so I, I said, I believe men have something like a menopause too. How do you think about it? Because I definitely went through something similar and he said, yeah, 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 I, I had a burnout too. I just tried to deflect and, and create balance again. And I'm not doing it on purpose. It just happens, I can't shut up. It could have ended very bad with him feeling bad about me doing that. But that in that case, it just means we're not fit to be friends. But he took it very well. You're an e you become an equalizer. You become a natural harmonizer. And that is what real healing is about. Creating harmony. And it's something you don't even have to try. You're already doing it before you realize. It took me decades to discover that that was what I'm doing to understand it. And I know that everybody who practices real yoga develops these qualities very naturally. That is also why it is so important that, that yoga is spread into this world. That we share it with people in our own way. You don't have to become a teacher. Of course, if you want to, it's good, it's nice. But just as a 
as a parent, as a sibling, as a, as a child of your parents, as a colleague, you will naturally create harmony where there is lack of it. When you hear people talking about yoga, or when you read the books about yoga, you hear about CDs, supernatural, paranormal abilities, and you see them as something far away from you. There are not many people. Or do they even really exist? But they are phenomena that are very subtle, and you do not easily recognize and you possess them already before you actually realize it. Turning lead into gold is one of them. Your ability to see the law of cause and effect at work where other people's where other people can only see the surface it's, that's a city. Your ability to connect the dots in the past and based on that insight develop a vision of the future, that's a city. And it's something that happens before you even realize it. Because it is an internal process and it's very subtle. It doesn't come out and start screaming at you like, hey, look at me, I'm your new city. It's something that comes very gradually expands, just like consciousness started gradually and is constantly expanding. And you don't even realize that it is there. And it should not be important, just function in your new condition. Good. That's it for now. I'm not good at farewell speeches, so I'm not going to do that. This was my uh, conclusion of the course. We have a new uh, pranayama, a very special one, which we will do after um, asana practice. Questions? Okay, let's have a short break.